Welcome this morning to uh, the service, uh, the teaching uh, uh, section of the service here, and we'll get into God's Word. Let's take a confession this morning before we get into the Word. One to go. As I sit to listen to the Word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto me, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I am not distracted by anything or anyone. The Word of God is full to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, correction, encouragement, correction, and the enablement to live out God's will. Amen. All right. Uh, this morning, I want to continue a thought that we started at the Abuja Ward conference, and I want to um, look into something. And what we saw there was the fact that Peter both experienced success and also failure in operating in the supernatural in walking there with Jesus Christ. We see in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22, something there. We're going to read Matthew 14, 22 to verse 33. All right? And straight away Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a sheep and to go before him to the other side. And then he sent the multitudes away. And the Bible says, And when he had sent the multitudes away, when he went up to the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And verse 24, But the sheep was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary unto them. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the water. And the Bible says, when the disciples saw him walking on water, all right, or on the sea, they were troubled, and then he said, it is, it is a spirit, and cried out for fear. And then Jesus straight away said to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And then Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on water. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down from the sheep, he walked on water to go to Jesus. And then when he saw the wind that was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. So here we have Peter experiencing two things. Number one, he experienced, he was successful in experiencing the supernatural in walking on water with Jesus. But then at the same time, a point came when Peter began to experience failure. And the scripture says he began to sink. Now, so I want to look at what made him, that Peter, succeed and what also was responsible for the failure of Peter. Because if you know why people succeed and then you know why people fail, then you can do what you ought to do in order to succeed and make sure as a person that you do not participate in anything that will cause or bring about failure. And many times it is not that people are not, don't know the right thing or even start practicing the right thing. It is the contamination of the right thing with some wrong thing that actually brings about failure. 
In other words, fear contaminates their faith. They believe, but that belief is contaminated by something else. That's why the man who brought his child to Jesus and said, you know, have mercy if you can help me. Jesus said, if you believe, all things are possible. He said, I believe, but help thou my own belief. And so you see Jesus telling Jairus when he was going with him to go and get his daughter healed. And then they came to Jairus and told Jairus about the death of the child that don't bother him any longer. And then Jesus said, believe, only believe. In other words, that thing of faith must operate only. You cannot have the contamination of faith. Fear not, but only believe. And he says, your daughter is going to be made whole. So some people believe, but at the same time, there is a contamination there with something else. That's why they are lukewarm. In other words, there is heat there, but at the same time, it's been diluted with, all right, that which is cold. And so they think that they can go on that particular way. And Jesus said, I will spew you out because that's the only time, you know, we can actually get you to realize uh, the, the wrong that is actually going on. So Peter got it right by getting God's word. We're going to see this for the very thing that he wanted to do. He did not see Jesus on water and then jumped out himself and said, I also am going to walk out on water. He didn't make any presumption there. He understood that he had to hear God or Jesus. He had to hear Jesus Christ himself telling him to come. He couldn't just say that, well, God is good. He did it for somebody else. He will also do it for me. He is a good God. He had to hear Jesus say to him, come. In other words, he had to get God's word for that particular situation. And then what brought about his downfall? Now, God's word, getting God's word for that particular situation there is what will produce success. What will produce success is getting the word of God, having respect unto God's word. And that I'm going to go into this thing, having gotten the authorization from God to get myself involved in it. It might be a good thing. It might look like a right thing. But I have got to hear God concerning that particular thing. Paul himself said in Galatians chapter 3, all right, and verse 22, Paul said in Galatians, he said, I went up there by revelation. Sorry, Galatians 2.2. 2. Paul said, I went up. I went up by revelation. In other words, I didn't just go up of my own self. I went up by revelation. So what will bring about success in getting supernatural results is that you go up by revelation. Jesus said, when I sent you, did you lack anything? When I sent you, listen. They toiled all night and caught nothing. Then Jesus sent them to go and catch fish. And Peter said, we have toiled all night but caught nothing. Nevertheless, we will do it again according to your word. Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. So what brings about success is, nevertheless, I will do it again 
if I have your word authorizing me to do it. Okay, that's what brings a success there. So David will go up to God when it's time to go to battle. Lord, should I go or should I not go? They knew that the key to success in anything you are doing was that you heard God tell you. You are not assuming that God will back you. You are not assuming. I mean, it's almost like saying that a person has a lot of money. It's a very wealthy person. And you also understand that the person is a very kind person. Now, you now make an assumption that because this person is a good person and is a kind person, this person probably will give me the finances that I need for this particular project. Let's, for example, buy a car. And so you therefore go ahead without you getting that person's promissory note of verbal commitment that I will give you the money to buy that car. You went and bought the car. You did that presumptuously. In other words, you are assuming that that person who did not tell you they are going to back you with their resources will get it done. And so you go there and you start telling the person, you know, you're a good person, a very kind person. You know, I know that. And then what you're trying to do is that you're even trying to use praise to manipulate that person. And the person knows that this is manipulation. That you don't go ahead and do something without first and foremost getting my own authorization of verbal commitment on that particular thing. So the key is this. Peter saw Jesus and had the discipline there to say, bid me to come. And Jesus therefore said to him, come. Now, what made him fail? What made him fail after he had gotten God's word was this. God's word will always work wonders in our lives while we see and act upon eternal realities, which is his promises. But, and it will continue to work and produce results in our lives if we are not influenced by temporal things to the contrary. In other words, temporal things on the outside coming in and influencing us. So that's what Jonah said. They that behold lying vanities will forsake their own mercy. Now, but the point here is how do I put myself in a position where the temporal things do not affect me, okay? So you go to God in prayer, and God starts out, we see this in Second Peter chapter 1, and believe verse, all right, 19. It says, we have a more sure word of prophecy that you will do well to take heed unto as a light that shines in a dark place. What is this word, more sure word of prophecy? When you go to God in prayer, God answers you with getting scriptures into your heart that actually fit that particular situation and will minister to you what God wants to do. It is a more sure word of prophecy, which means it's a prophetic word. It will tell you what is going to come out of that particular situation. In other words, there is darkness and it's like a light that shines in a dark place and it is prophetic in nature. All right? Also, it's going to direct your steps as to what you are going to do because the word is a lamp unto my feet and it's also a light unto my path. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119 and verse 130, 
it says the entrance of God's word giveth light. Psalm 119 and verse 130. 130. It says the entrance of God's word. It says the entrance of God's word giveth light. All right. And understanding to the simple. We've also said this here that God says every good and perfect gift comes from above. Comes from the father of lights. That is the father who will give it in the form of light. And then he says, who hath begotten us of the word of truth there. So it's through the word of God he brings light there. That's why when we go on in that chapter 1 of James, it tells us that lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and then receive with meekness the engrafted word of God which is able to save your soul. All right, verse 21. Lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And then he says, receive with meekness the engrafted. That word engrafted means the implanted. And this is what I want to say today, which means the word is the implanted, which is able to save your soul. So God plants his word on the inside for that particular situation. And then he says, receive that particular word. Now, why do people keep praying and praying and praying and praying, and sometimes you don't see results? Romans chapter 1, sorry, Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 tells us clearly. It says, my brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness that is of God. Then he says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. It says this, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, that a man who does this thing shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. In your mouth and in your heart. He said, this is the word of faith that we preach. In other words, this is what I'm saying here. That the person that the word entered into that person. The reason why they started out and they were succeeding. And the suddenly after some time it's possible you're beginning to experience failure or stagnancy. Is that that word must always be nigh thee. In thy mouth and inside your heart. I ask you this question and answer it. If you are experiencing stagnancy and it seems like nothing is happening again, I put this challenge to you. Is the word of God or God's word that you know close to you? Is it consistently on your lips and inside your heart? Do you see the law of confession as something you understand, but you are not practicing? You see, the word that works, it says, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. John 15 and verse 7 says, if you abide in me, John 15, 7, and my words abide in you. It's called the abiding word of God, which means are God's words still abiding on the inner side of you? Joshua, this is why they fail. This is why temporal things begin to influence you. 
Temporal things, this is what causes failure, bring, begins to influence a person there because the word of God is no longer. So I can, let me give an example. I was started with church and church wasn't going to I would go out there and I would look out of the window to see cars before I come to preach. And I would look at the cars there and sometimes uh, the cars will be coming and they'll be, and I will be happy. And I will come down to come and preach. And sometimes I'll look at the cars and there'll be few. And then I will come down, all right, and I'll not feel too good and I will come to preach. In other words, temporal things there were influencing the state of my mind. And therefore, the way in which when I stand there, I could stand there slightly sad or I could stand there slightly, all right, happy. But you've got to get to a point where what you see no longer influences you. What people say no longer discourages you. You are no longer influenced by what you are seeing, hearing, all right, or even feeling about that particular condition there. You are now influenced only by the word of God. And the way that happens is, which means the word is abiding, is the word is on your lips and the word is inside your heart there. So you go to God in prayer. He says, this is the word of faith we are preaching. That the word is nigh thee, in thy mouth and inside the heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. So he says, if you abide in me and my words are abiding in you. That's what he also speaks about when he told Joshua in Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that thou might observe to do, which means you are meditating in that particular thing. And this is what I want to teach and explain how it happens. Day and night, you are meditating in it. It's on your lips. It's inside your heart. Remember, the scripture tells us the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. And listen to this. And the lust of other things can choke the word. If you haven't pulled up that scripture, it says, and it becometh unfruitful. In other words, the word was once fruitful and producing results. You see, the seed of the kingdom is his word. It's his word he uses to do things. And then the word can be choked by the cares of this life, all right? The deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. It chokes the word. Let me put out the scripture, please. And it says, and it becomes unfruitful. So the word was fruitful, was producing results. But then after some time, they began to neglect that word. And neglecting that word now allowed circumstances now to now gain ascendancy and dominate the heart and the mind of that particular person. All right? It says this. Choke the word. Look at what it says. And it becomes. So the word was once fruitful, but then it becomes unfruitful. So what starts happening is that things that want to influence it will begin, all right, to influence that particular thing. So even though you know it, the word is not abiding on the inside of you. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 14. It says this about the abiding word. 1 John 2, 14. It says, I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. But I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong. Why? And the word of God abides in you. And because of that, you have overcome the wicked one. So I want to speak about this abiding word. That is, you heard, but is it abiding on the inside of you? Right? Or has it stopped rolling? The engine has come to an end, which means... The engine there is no longer working, it's there, but it's no longer functional. Is the word abiding on the inside of you? 
Is the word of God, are you meditating, all right, on God's word there? Is the word nigh thee, in thy mouth and inside thy heart? So you can be praying about something, but is the word of God near unto you, in your mouth and inside your heart concerning that thing? Now, if you are not, you will begin to see a deterioration in things, in the condition on the outside. Take this thing serious. You could have started out and you are succeeding. Listen, Peter was walking on water and he came to a point where the same person that was walking on water began to sink. And he got to a point where he had to cry out and say, all right, uh, Jesus, save me from this situation. And Jesus pulled him out and put him there, but he couldn't function like Jesus because that word wasn't abiding on the inside of him. That's why the scripture tells us in, we saw this in 2 Peter 1, uh, 2 Peter yeah, 1 and verse 19. It says this confirmed, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, which means it's inside your heart that the morning star is going to rise. That is, you experience it inside your heart before it happens on the outside. Until there is the dawning of the day. So the path of the just is a light that shineth brighter and brighter until you come to what you call a perfect day experience on the inside. It says, don't be a hearer only, but be a doer. It says, who is a hearer? There's a man who had the word, looked at himself, forgot what manner of man he is. But whosoever continueth, all right, whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, continuity inside the word of God there. He says, this person shall be blessed in his deed. Whatsoever this person does shall prosper. Blessed is that man that taketh not the counsel of the ungrateful, don't walk it in the, all right, where the wicked not stands in the, in the seat, in the seat of the scorn, scornful. But his delight is in the word of the Lord. And in this does he meditate day and night, continuity. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, or let waters there. And whatsoever he does shall prosper. If Satan wants to stop anything, he wants to stop all right, the word of God abiding on the inside of you. That is exactly what he wants to stop. Continuity there. John 8 tells us, verse 30, he says to his disciples, to those that believed on him. All right, those that believed on him. He said, if you, he spoke these words, many believed in him. Next verse. All right, and Jesus said to those Jews that believed him, believed him, if you abide in my word, then are you my disciples indeed abiding. And he now says this. This is what will be the experience. And you are going to know the truth. And the truth will make you free. So between believing and experiencing freedom is abiding in the word of God. That's the core of the Word of Faith movement. The distinction in the Word of Faith movement, what they teach is that you enter into God's Word and never come out of the Word of God and you leave out the Word of God wherever you are because that Word is abiding on the inside. So I want to share what it means to have that Word abiding on the inside of you or meditation there on God's word. That means the word is on your lips and that word is inside your heart. What this means here is you have a continuous confession of God's word as meditation inside your heart. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. To abide. Oh, for that word to abide in you is you are not speaking it to anyone. You are speaking it to your own self. You are reminding yourself through the words you hear and you start hearing 
of the things that God said. Say, so you need to give a more earnest heed to the things you have heard, lest at any time you let them sleep. Because if you don't, he said you are neglecting so great a salvation. And he talked about that salvation there in Hebrews 2 and verse 1. He says, this is this salvation, this is what brought signs. Therefore, we give a more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away, or King James says, we let them sleep. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received the just compense of the word, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So you can neglect it. That's what happened. He says, which at first was spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to those that heard him. Look at the result here. Verse 4, God bearing witness both with signs, wonders, various miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Which means if you abide in it, after some time, signs and wonders will begin to happen. All right? Gifts of the Holy Ghost will begin to happen. God starts confirming that word within the life of that person. So how does the word of God abide in you? And when the word of God is abiding in you, you will not be influenced by things again, okay? So what happens is if the word of God is abiding on the inside of me and I am, I've gone to God, listen to this, to prayer here for, let's say, this church to grow. And the church just has, I mean, you won't believe that when we came to Igomu Center, right, from Yerba, we just had maybe, uh, we didn't even get to the halfway. So let's say we had, uh, seven rows or so. In fact, there was a gentleman who was a minister in church at that point. He came in thinking, oh, this place is bigger than all of that. He came to meet me and said, listen, I'm going back, all right, to Yaba. And I knew that he was discouraged by what he saw, all right, right there. So he said, I'm going back, right, to Yaba. We had just like seven rows of people. Now, if I got to a point where I looked at those seven rows there and I was discouraged by what I was seeing, then the word of God to bring about growth in that place is not abiding, was not abiding on the inside of me. Simple. All right? If I came in there and the place was full and I was happy, the word of God concerning it wasn't abiding on the inside. When the word of God is abiding on the inside of you, you are not influenced by anything that you see. Positive or negative doesn't change you. Because the word of God concerning that thing is on the inside of you. So you go to God concerning his word, he places it. But that light must shine brighter and brighter, which means that he begins to reveal more and more to you concerning that thing. So I place that word on my lips there. And you practice meditation. Now, uh, the best example of meditation, my, my, my spiritual teacher when I was on campus all right, wrote a book by, back then, Chewing the Word of God. I think I still have it in my library there. That you chew the Word of God, okay? Uh, it's the same thing that he says in Jeremiah chapter 15 and 16. He says, thy words were found, as God revealed them. Jeremiah 15, 16. And I did eat them, and they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. So if I chew the Word of God, I come with joy and rejoicing, and, I con and I, that's what I spread there, regardless of what is going on on the outside. It doesn't influence, all right, me. Okay? And that's when you now begin to have steady growth. Or whatever you're believing God for, you begin to have the manifestation. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear unto my saints. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For that's when, and only when they walk. They are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. So let's assume God gives me some scriptures so I begin, all right, to confess those scriptures. In other words, let's say the scripture he gave, gave to me was for church growth. What he gave me, let's just say this here, is that I'll raise up shepherds that will feed your, my people with knowledge and understanding, and they shall not lack nor fear, and I will cause them to multiply, increase and to multiply. So I take that word and I now begin, all right, to confess that particular word there. I'm saying it out of my lips. Now, it is what you are doing spiritually is what sheep do, and it's the same thing that cows also do, but sheep do it. It is what is called the regurgitation there. In other words, it's when they chew the cord. So what happens is if you give a cow here or sheep, right, um, grass or whatever it is they eat, 
and they take it, they feed on it, and it goes to a part in their stomach where it is kept in that part. They have four different parts on their stomach. I've taught this before. You have four different sections of your heart. Now, it, it is kept in one part, and I believe this is correct, that is also kept in a particular part of your heart where it is, you understand the logic of it because one part of your heart is logic. Another part deals with pictures and imaginations. That's how we see your pictures. Another part deals with emotions, and another part deals with response to external stimuli. So when you get revelation, it sticks in that part of logic there. But you don't, you know, it's, there's nothing, you're not emotional, you're not excited. You understand it, but it's not, you know, and all of that. So they bring it back up, and what happens is they start chewing on that thing. So what happens is I pull up that word there, and I start confessing it. Now, the interesting thing that I just discovered, so, well, you can say what you want to say, but I discovered this here that the cow or the sheep chews on the cord for about eight hours every single day, which means for eight hours, it's chewing on that cord there. So it, it allows it, goes about its business, a time again comes, it pulls it out, it chews upon it, right? Chews upon it until it gets to a point where Sometimes it chews on some, it can digest some, so they move into the other part. It keeps it again there, brings it again and chews on that particular thing, digests and all of this. And it says for eight hours. And I remember, I was saying this at the Abuja World Conference, I remember that, Kenneth, um, sorry, I just was watching this recently. And Dr. Jerry Savell said, the Holy Ghost told him, you're getting ready for ministry. He said, prepare for this by spending eight hours in my word every day. In other words, it's almost like meditation. And I just say it was exactly the same time. I'm just saying that exactly the same time, all right, for it. And, 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 and when you say, well, how come some people haven't gotten healed? They are praying. Let me tell you why. Because they haven't gotten the word of God concerning it. Or they are not chewing on the word of God that they have gotten concerning that particular thing. Let me, let me show you this. When they came to meet, Paul came to meet the disciples in Acts chapter 19 and verse 2, Acts 19, 2. He said, why have you not received the Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said, we have not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. In other words, why do people not get healed? Number one, because they haven't heard from heaven concerning the healing. Not that they haven't prayed, they haven't heard. Listen, not that they haven't prayed, they haven't heard. David said, Lord, if you are silent unto us, we will be like them that go down to the pit. In other words, your purpose of prayer is to hear from heaven or there's no difference between you and the person that didn't pray. It's to hear from God. That's the power in prayer. So you hear concerning the healing. Then you start chewing upon it. I asked Reverend Mark Hankins during the COVID shutdown when we were doing question and answer. I said, what do you think will be responsible for a person who, who, who hears God's word but doesn't have results in his life? He said, the word Paul said I planted, Apollos watered. He said, many times it is the engrafted word. It has been planted, but that word has not been watered, which means there's not, he said, that's where the thing is, which means they believe, but there's no continuity in the word. So let me quickly get into this. So to abide in that word, when the word abides in you, uh, there's a definition in Greek here which is extremely powerful. To abide is to continuously receive from that particular thing. In other words, if the word of God is abiding in you, every day you'll be ministered to from that word. The way they chew the cord and extract nourishment, that scripture every day will give you fresh insight. That's when you are meditating on it. Listen, fresh insight every day. If I take it there and I'm saying that, you know, uh, I'll give you shepherds that will raise according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding, uh, and, and you'll be increased and you multiply. The scripture like that it says you have no lack. I now begin to chew on that. Every day, what happens? I'll start receiving spiritual insight. Nudges will begin to come in. Flashes there in spirit. I'll begin to receive every day. The Holy Spirit will add another scripture there as I'm confessing. So I decide. 
that because this thing I want to, to, you know, it says with the increase of the lips that had to be filled, I want this thing or I don't. Uh, he gives me his word. I'm not waiting for it to happen. I'm receiving it there. So I take time. I schedule my time there. You schedule it. Okay? Even if it's on, on every hour for two minutes, you remind yourself of that word. But you schedule that particular thing. It, it is serious business. If they tell you that you have, you have a terminal case, then... There's no point in just going on with your life continuously. You shut down everything. You tell people, listen to me. i got to shut this thing down now. And I'm going on a one-month holiday to deal with this particular thing. You go there and not just to be saying, God, and crying, God, do something, God. You have to, no, 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 no. You go there to receive, all right? And the way you do it, you receive from the engrafted word of God. So you get God's word on it, and then you begin to pace the floor here, and you are confessing. Then the Holy Spirit begins to bring to your remembrance things Jesus has told you. You will bring out another scripture here and begin to confess it. So I am, I am meditating on Wolf Beck 2025 now. I've started the meditation on it. One day when I was confessing this regurgitation here, the Spirit of God reminded me of a scripture in Isaiah 25 when we started, um, um, when we're going to have what Beck said, this is what is going to happen. So I take that scripture, I begin to declare that scripture out of my lips now, okay? He says, the word is nigh thee in thy mouth and in thy heart. In thy mouth, in thy heart. So I say it again. Then the Holy Ghost reminds me of another one. Now I'm just pacing the floor, all right, inside my room there uh, or wherever I am, and I'm saying it to myself. And then it flashes something. And then I get some insight from what is being said there. I get some insight, all right, from what is being said. I get from insight, all right, from it. I confess. It brings out another scripture. I say it. And I'm doing this periodically throughout the entire day. That's how, after some time, he says, you will come to, that word know the truth means to experience it. It's something will happen on the inside of you, and that truth will set you free. And you know, once that sets you free, it has become a permanent future in your life. That word has now become flesh. It's, it's like reflex action. It's like a person who has learned how to ride a bicycle. Uh, it's become part and parcel of your life. Uh, and so it's important, uh, we'll continue this thought, uh, to constantly receive nourishment. Some of you know hundreds of scriptures that are inside you, but there's no regurgitation of those scriptures. There's no bringing those scriptures back up there as you are declaring and connecting the dots in those scriptures there reciting those things to your own self back, feeding your heart concerning it, receiving light, turning the page of the Bible to read something again and doing that. And so your, your time of meditation gets enriched every single day with more knowledge that you have. You get to a place where you are being enriched there because there are several scriptures. You understand what David was saying? He says, your thoughts towards us are more than can be numbered. Uh, there are several directions you can go in terms of getting the manifestation of this healing there. Then he reminds you of a message you heard 15 years ago. He reminds you, you are digging the wells. The water is now coming out. You are getting to that point. You get to a point where your heart no longer is responsive to anything on the outside. If somebody comes and meets you and says that this, you, you, know, if you are even not responsive there. Nothing, you know, so there's nothing that is there. You are in this particular state. Uh, someone says that, you see, you, 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 you meditate on the love of God to the point where it has entered into your being. Somebody says, you know, you are totally stupid. You, are, and say, you just look at it and say, look, my friend, I, you know, you even tell the person, you don't know why the person, look, you'll be making a case for the person. That you, as, as David said, you say, you don't know why. Maybe if the person is saying, you don't understand. Just leave the person. You talk to the person. You have to react. You can't even react negatively again because that word is on the inside of you. So the more you go to God in prayer, the more he feeds you with scriptures. And you enter the joy of Christianity, abundant life. It creates joy on the inside. 
When you thank God, that's what it means. Let the word of God dwell richly in you in all wisdom. Then you begin to praise and thank God for it. All right? Just like look, David, I'm sorry, Jonah said. He said, they that observe lying vanities. That's what happened to Peter. He observed lying vanities and forsook the mercy of God. Now, you don't observe lying vanities, but what you do, you offer the voice of thanksgiving unto God. You are praising and thanking God for that thing. You just say, thank you, Jesus, because in your meditation, you have seen these things. So you can get to a point in meditation there where the Holy Spirit starts showing. That's what we're talking about. When he says, the Holy Spirit says, how will you manifest yourself to us and not to others? He starts manifesting. It becomes real and tangible on the inside of you. It's meditation that does that. And you do it continually. The day you stop, the day you stop, just look on the outside you'll begin to see signs of degeneration, okay? Signs. You can try this and try that and try this and try that. Try that technique. Nah. It is the pockets of light that drop into your consciousness while you meditate. Those are the things that will actually produce results within your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this word this morning. I ask by the power of your spirit that you establish us in this truth, cause it to expand within our consciousness and bring forth massive fruits within our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. All right, a couple of announcements before we go. Uh, first thing is that um, this week is the last week for, it closes on the 16th, all right, for community groups, all right? So if you want to join a community groups, they have over 50 of these community groups that you can join, and um, you can go to tcncommunitygroups.com, tcncommunitygroups.com, and register, and, and um, um, wherever you're watching all over the world, you can join a community group. We have a lot of community groups in the diaspora, which you can join and connect with people um, concerning that. And you can even develop friendships with people across whether Europe or North America or, or Asia and get to know people there. All right. Um, also, this Saturday for Abuja TC, sorry, I said to say, B Conference will happen, not this Saturday, sorry. All right. 2nd of November is B Conference, and we have extremely powerful speakers. So for TC and Abuja people, or if you're in any center in Nigeria and you want to go, all right, I believe it to be a really richly rewarding thing. Now from next week, we're going to start our prayers towards Wolfbeck, all right, 2025. And um, I think we are doing something very historic in that meeting if you operate by discernment. And one of the things we're going to get done in this country is to bring two streams together that need to come together. And I, I know this is a massively prophetic event it's going to be. We're having calls from people from different parts of the world, all right? About 50 people said they're coming in from one church in Ghana. I just opened my phone. People telling me they're coming from Netherlands, that's Holland, coming from various places. Uganda tells us that a thousand, but we don't believe, maybe about 250 will come out from Uganda, South Sudan, Rwanda, Kenya, Ethiopia. All right, so this is going to be a massive voice here of the, of the gospel for Africa. I was sent this. Let me just quickly read it. Uh, this was a meeting that was started by um, um, by um, um, Billy Graham in 50 years ago by Billy Graham, and it's called the um, Luzon uh, 2004. They come together, leaders there, and I was sent by a friend of mine who are in the executive together when we're on campus, and she's also Pastor Yinka Demi's elder sister. All right, so and she sent this to me. This meeting was held in September 24. South Korea, in Seoul, South Korea. And what they say from the reports here is that by two, by the, on the year 2050, the Nigerian female Christian will be the most predominant 
female there. This is what he says. Luzerne 220, 2024 report has it that the dominant representation of the global Christian is the Nigerian woman by 2050. That is, the Nigerian Christian woman will be the most dominant force for Christianity. That's why women's meeting, you shouldn't play with this thing. 2050, I have, I have it right here on my phone with all the reports. All right, right there. Billy Graham started this film, and they make projections concerning things, whether there's growth, whether there's stagnancy in the world, and all of that. All right? So Nigeria holds a very strategic role. That's why we are not uh, surprised at the kind of attacks that is coming out now on the church in this country. All right? Satan is trying to shut something now, but I guarantee you he's going to fail completely. All right, because the Holy Spirit is more powerful than social. Listen to me, it will, that thing will be shut down in the realm of the Spirit. We agree the excesses in the body of Christ. We agree, all right, even to an extent here, that some caution should have been brought out earlier on. But what, some, what is going on right now is not the right way to do this. And people are exploiting something, and that has to be shut down. All right, then. All right. So, right, so get ready, start preparing, and we are doing our 90 days of planting. Please join us in it. God bless you all, and have a wonderful week in his presence.